Dr. Mark Cotter is one of the world's leading researchers in cervical spondylotic myelopathy. We've come here to Addenbrooke's Hospital to find out a bit more about the condition. We're here with Mark Cotter a researcher at the University of Cambridge and a neurosurgeon at Addenbrooke's Hospital. And we're going to talk about CSM. Hi, Mark. So could you tell us about CSM, please? What does that name mean? Hi, Liz. So cervical stands for of the neck. Um, spondylotic means wear and tear change, such as arthritic changes. And myelopathy is really a bunch of symptoms that relate to damage of your spinal cord. When was it first described as a condition? So we know about this disease for a long time. The first description was in 1928, as far as I know, when um, Stockley um, looked at um, patients and started to operate on what he thought was tumours of um, the discs. Um, later on, we then realised it's degenerative changes rather than tumours. So it's, it's been around for a long time. And what are the symptoms of the disease? It often starts uh, very subtle. So you get some numbness and some clumsiness in your hands and you may notice some problems with your gait and your, and your balance. And um, you develop what's called hyperreflexia or spasticity. And the symptoms then can progress and at the end um, affect your bladder, your bowel function, and really you can become paralyzed from the neck downwards. So this is an MRI scan of a patient with cervical spondylotic myelopathy and you can see um, he's cut um, sagittally, see his neck here and the back of his head here. This is his spinal column, cervical spine from here to here. You can see behind the spinal vertebra bodies, um, the spinal cord running down in the spinal canal. And What's quite apparent if you look at this is that, that there are areas where the spinal canal becomes very tight. And this particular area between C3 and 4, um, there's a large disc prolapse uh, which is causing compression of the spinal cord. And um, the levels below here, again, there are degenerative changes uh, that compromise uh, the spinal canal. That, that is the setup uh, that uh, predisposes people from developing cervical myelopathy. We're here at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory for the Patient and Public Involvement Day for CSM, where we were talking to some of the patients about their condition. Hi Shirley, so could you tell us please, when did the symptoms first present themselves? I started with tinglings down my left arm and pain Oh, I think it was back in May 2011. What came next? Well, basically, um, I just I just thought, oh, nothing of it, really. And then I, I watched and waited myself. And then as the tingling started to go further up my arm and shoot down, I thought, oops, something wrong here. I went to the GPs and he said, let's just wait and see. So he <laughs> made me wait and see another month. And then I went back because by that time, it's actually spreading from the upper arm down. And it got to the point where my arm was actually going heavy and I, thought, I almost thought like I had had a stroke, mm. even though I wasn't having a stroke, but my arm would suddenly go slumpy like that and, oh, and uh, it was scary. really, really painful. Yeah, it's a bit disturbing. And then it was at that point they thought, mm, it might be carpal tunnel syndrome, let's send you for some tests. Okay, and they came back negative, Negative, <laughs> yeah, totally negative, yeah. Okay. Which is what I was expecting because I've got a nursing background, so for me, myself, it didn't fit the right pattern. But mm -hmm. And then that was with the GP, so what was the next stage? Next stage was when that came back negative, I was obviously referred to a, um, a local neurologist mm -hmm. who did all the pin prick testing and the reflex testing and things like that. Mm -hmm. He didn't say very much, he said, well just get an MRI scan. 
Okay. Um, and, you know, we'll wait and see. So I ended up having my MRI scan, but that wasn't until January 2012. So already it's been quite some time. So your disease had progressed in the meantime? In the meantime, yes, absolutely. So the, I had the MRI scan in January, got the results back, and did a, you've got cervical myelopathy, and it needs it, warranting the attention of the spinal care team at Leeds General Infirmary. That was sort of the tone of the letter. So, Alan, um, could you tell us a little bit about how your symptoms first started, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'll say it was 2000 and the end of 2013, going into 2014. I had trouble walking. My legs were like lead, basically. I was out walking with people and getting slower and slower. The muscles were like becoming rigid. I thought, it was strange. I went to see the GP. He checked more for, you know, the circulation was all right and everything like that. I said, no, you seem all right with that, fine. OK, went back home. This was in the January 2014, I saw him first. Went back home and then uh, couldn't turn in bed, couldn't turn over, basically. You know, like turning instalments. Mm. Oh, this, is, this is very strange. And then the thing that convinced me something was really wrong, I went to turn the clock radio alarm off to go to work. I put my hand out and it froze for about seven seconds. I panicked, I thought, what the hell? Is it? And then all of a sudden my hand just moved and I switched it off as normal, I thought something really wrong here so I went back to the GP and said look you know, the legs are still bad and now I've got this can't turn in bed and I put my hand out to do that and you know I was immediately thinking well, I've got something like MS or Parkinson's checking out mm. but uh, they sent me for the uh, to see a consultant he did the old tests on you etc and then he said oh, just to make sure we're gonna do a scan on your brain and your neck I thought neck I've nothing wrong with my neck I've never had neck pain or anything like that went along with it and got the day and the scan was months a couple of months down the line and of course things were dragging on so wife and I decided we phoned them up and said look can we just pay to get the scan ourselves and speed things up so we phoned them up and said yeah can you come tomorrow <laughs> next day so we did when I had the brain scan next scan and just thinking that was it they'd go back but the bloke called us in and what a radiologist or whatever and he said, because you've got your brain and neck, you thought you might be worried you want to know straight away. He said, your brain's fine. I thought, that's great news. But he goes, I can tell what your problem is. There's a white dot on your spinal cord. You see the disc of all in. And he goes, this is quite serious. I thought, oh, great. Mm. So then he said, I know your consultant, the first one. I'll speak to him. And uh, he passed me on then to, the, well, the consultant found me at home, luckily. Fair play to him. He told me uh, this had probably been going on for a few years. OK, a gradual deterioration. I'm thinking back, actually, about five years ago, on and off, I had trouble walking. The legs would get heavy, and they'd just go away again. So it was a sort of like on and off thing. remitting type Yeah, and it, I was in the gym after that and everything, so it's something that was creeping up in the background, I think, for... He did say it quite a long time. Yeah, was there so. any predisposing factors, do you think, in your lifestyle or... Nope. ..your familial history or anything like that? The only thing possibly could have been, as say, my father did have cervical spondylosis. He had neck trouble, wore, um, kept his neck warm and everything towards the end of his life. Mm. So possibly hereditary thing, maybe, but I certainly never had any injuries, any neck pain. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for talking to us today. So are you, would you be able to describe the onset of your symptoms, please? Yeah, really, it just started off with um, like pins and needles in the left hand, left arm, um, weakness in the left side, left leg, um, which just progressed slowly. Um, now I, I had back pain, so they thought I had kidney stones as well, which they sent me for treatment because I've got a history of kidney stones. And then they um, also thought I had carpal tunnel, so I actually had an operation for carpal tunnel before they actually diagnosed myelopathy. Oh, OK. And so how long was it from your start of your symptoms to when you received your diagnosis? Probably about three to four years. Oh, goodness. And what did your GP think of this? Well, they were very disappointed, to be honest with you, because it was always, oh, you've got carpal tunnel and you've just got to wait for a, an operation on it and that's all they seemed bothered about. Did you have an MRI? I had MRIs, yes. Um, unfortunately the MRI was missed by the hospital. Uh, I, the result wasn't passed on by the uh, surgeon who read them or radiologist and it was only when I was sent for a work medical that they picked up 
the MRI report they wanted a copy and they picked up myelopathy on it. They told me I need to get back to see my um, specialist at the hospital and see why this hasn't been acted upon because I've been off work a long time, mm. which they then acted upon it. So um, it was affecting your ability to work by this point? Yep, yep, because I was a train driver and oh. with the uh, medication they couldn't let you drive trains so I was just sitting at home. Was that pain medication? That pain medication, yep. Um, all sorts of different concoctions they've tried from tramadol, amitriptyline, gabapentin, mm -hmm. so l loads of different medication. And that was causing you side effects, was it? Yeah, yeah well, it, it causes drowsiness a lot of the time, lack of, uh, lack of concentration. And then um, you were referred for surgery? Yeah, after the MRI, um, they then sent me, uh, my work sent me for an MRI, my employers, and it was picked up then by the hospital again, uh, two different MRIs that showed myelopathy, so they sent me to see a neurosurgeon at Adam Brooks Hospital, Cambridge, who was absolutely fantastic and said you need surgery ASAP, and three weeks later I was under the knife. Oh, and do you know what surgery it was that they carried out? Yes, it was uh, ACDF, uh, anterior disc discectomy infusion, C3, C4, C5 in the neck. And so what's been the result of that surgery? Some symptoms have improved, some haven't. When you get a lot of the bad symptoms like um, loss of bowel control and things like that, they've completely improved and got a lot better than what they were. A bladder control is a lot better. Pins and needles hasn't improved, but um, Overall, they said it wasn't a cure, it was to preventative. They said if I hadn't had the operation, I'd have been in a wheelchair within six months. The Laboratory of Regenerative Medicine here at the University of Cambridge is one of the only places in the world studying CSM. We've come here to meet Dr. Fahana Akhtar, a PhD student in Dr. Mark Cotter's lab. Hi Fahana. Hi. So Liz. you started off with a medical degree and now what's the focus of your PhD? So I'm currently uh, investigating the mechanisms of injury of the condition, CSM. I'm also looking at um, how uh, the physiology behind recovery uh, following surgery. And what got you interested in CSM? So I think CSM is actually a fascinating disease. Um, it's actually the most common condition um, affecting the spinal cord in adults. Um, however, a lot of patients, uh, the public in general, and actually healthcare professionals, uh, they're not really aware of this condition. And I think that itself is just fascinating and it just makes me want to investigate the disease a little bit more. So what's the main line of inquiry in your PhD? So I'm uh, uh, doing a, a basic science PhD where I'm looking into the actual uh, disease process and I'm looking at the various different uh, things that could cause the disease and also uh, following surgery there are uh, a lot of patients um, who don't actually recover fully so I want to investigate what are the reasons behind that um, and the mechanisms of recovery and why some people do not recover. So what have you discovered so far? So in this lab uh, we have uh, developed a unique model of CSM where we simulated the real condition that affects humans and we found a number of fascinating things. So we found that um, axons um, uh, die um, and also they can regenerate uh, via a process called sprouting following surgery. So this is one of the things that fascinate me and I want to investigate that further. Do you know much about what causes the axons to die? So interestingly, um, as I said previously, um, there are not um, many um, studies uh, looking into CSM and we know a few things. So we know that uh, cells um, can die by a process called apoptosis and these cells include uh, neurons and oligodendrocytes. However, we don't actually quite know the full picture so we can't link all the processes together and there are definitely other mechanisms of death. So each of the, these cells have uh, various um, roles in, in the spinal cord and in CSM. CSM itself. So for example, microglia is involved in the inflammatory process um, and that is again one another aspect of uh, CSM that I'm in investigating, um, looking at uh, the role of inflammation and um, whether there is uh, an increase in inflammatory cells um, such as microglia and also what are the different types of um, uh, the microglia that's upregulated or downregulated in this condition. Um, I'm also looking at um, other cells including um, oligodendrocytes to see um, first of all if there is any um, 
change following surgery um, and if they have any role in actually um, in regeneration um, of the condition as well. Would they be um, involved in any process of remyelination? That is uh, something I'm currently investigating at the moment. Um, it's uh, unclear um, uh, whether there is in fact demyelination in this condition uh, primarily to begin with um, but that's something I'm actively investigating um, and that will enable me to also understand whether there is any actually uh, remyelination that could potentially take place following surgery. We and others have shown that there is also um, loss of uh, neurons in this condition and uh, particularly uh, a loss of axons um, which uh, uh, regenerate um, after surgery uh, via a process called sprouting. We have also shown that involvement of um, oligodendrocytes um, which are um, wrap around uh, the axons and are involved in producing myelin. This is an interesting um, cell uh, to look at and investigate further to see if there is any remyelination that could take place following surgery. Um, we have also shown that um, astrocytes are um, reduced at the site of compression, at the maximal site of compression. Um, however, they tend to um, increase um, at sites um, just below the compression as well. Hi Ewan, so you're here to tell us about your um, journey towards your diagnosis. So where did your symptoms first start? Um, my symptoms sort of started going back about 16 years ago. When I started having muscle problems, I kept on going back to the doctors, had physio treatment. What did your doctor think it was initially? He, he just said it was mu it was muscular. It wasn't anything serious. It was muscular. And what were you what were you feeling at the time? I was having neck problems. Mm. Um, I couldn't sort of shake off the muscular problems that I did. So even if, we, if I did a physio, I had acupuncture as well, and still, give it a few months, and I did the same problem and I'd go back and forth to the doctors. It wasn't until 2014, until I had the MRI and the X-ray, um, because things had get, got more serious that mm. I was diagnosed. So you started off with pain in, the, in your neck and shoulders, did you? And what yeah. progressed from there? 2014, I was working, and I was getting married in, in the October, so um, I went on a diet, so all of a sudden I had cramps in my arms, um, problems with numbness and things like that on my left arm. Um, and one day, while I was carrying um, animal feed, because I used to work in a warehouse, mm -hmm. I went to place the animal feed on top of another bag and I started losing my vision and everything. And I think that was the day I really took it seriously. Mm. CSM affects the spinal cord um, by the, the wear and tear changes in your spine really pressing on it mechanically. And because the spinal cord is a large conduit of information between the brain and the rest of your body, um, it's a very important structure. It also acts as a computer, so it coordinates um, motor function and pain. So you can well imagine if your spinal cord is damaged, that this has uh, grave consequences. Are there any predisposing factors? So we think there are, but we really, really don't know at this point. It's very interesting um, that you know, a large proportion of the population show wear and tear changes on their spine, but only a, um, a small proportion really uh, gets affected by CSM. And that points to a vulnerability of the spinal cord in these individuals. So it doesn't look like pressure directly translates into CSM. You, you need to have a certain predisposition, I think, um, to develop it. And is there a normal age of onset or does it occur in different age groups? So that's a difficult question. Um, the problem is that the symptoms are quite subtle and there are huge problems with diagnosis. But from what we know from the large surgical cohort studies is that it affects you in the prime time of your adulthood. So the average age of the larger surgical samples is about 56, 57. 
And how common is the condition? How does it compare to other well-known neurological conditions? I think it's a very common uh, disease. Um, but as I said, you know, there are problems with diagnosis and huge delays often in diagnosis. We know that about four in 100,000 per year are operated on because of CSM. And that equates to roughly the incidence of multiple sclerosis. And then from our um, research, we know that only about a third of patients that are diagnosed get an operation, which puts it up to about, uh, about the incidence of Parkinson's disease. And then if you think about all the patients that aren't diagnosed, um, we think it's, it affects um, quite a proportion of the population. If you look at the wear and tear changes of your spine in an age group above 50, and based on how many of these then go on to develop CSM, um, you could estimate that about 2% of the population are at risk for developing CSM. 2% of the population is quite a high proportion then. Yes, I'm not saying that 2% um, do get it, but um, from the numbers that we have at this point, that um, it, it, may, may, it may be possible. And how is the syndrome diagnosed? So primarily it's a, um, a syndrome, as you say, so it's a clinical diagnosis, so you need to present with certain signs, like spasticity, you have to present with uh, long tract signs, uh, like hyperreflexia, and then in order to uh, confirm that it's caused by wear and tear in your neck, you need an MRI scan, really. Okay, so um, could you tell us about the role of scanning in the diagnosis, please? MRI scans are fundamentally important um, because they allow you to visualise um, the spine, but also the compression of the spinal cord. And if there are no other reasons for you to have symptoms um, in the, uh, and they correspond to what you see in the scan, I think that's when you know that um, th this individual has CSM. So the GPs should be sending their patients off for MRI scans in order to confirm the diagnosis? So if they suspect um, that there are problems with the neck uh, causing neurological deficits, yes, then they should do that. Would patients have by this point um, sought any other type of therapies, for example, chiropractic treatment or physiotherapy? So we looked into this a bit, um, trying to understand um, how patients flow through the NHS or the healthcare system. And what we found is that uh, they come from all sorts of different uh, parts of the healthcare system. So we, we do get them from GPs who try and organise MRI scans. Um, Physiotherapy-led clinics are an important um, station, and it's actually that's where um, the diagnosis should be made and is often made. But I also got uh, referrals from dermatologists um, or incidental findings where people uh, underwent an MRI scan for a different reason. Neurologists often see uh, CSM patients as well. Mm -hmm. But generally, I think that the pathways aren't uh, as developed as you would, would hope.